In recent years, hypersonics have been all the rage, both in the halls of the Pentagon and in defense media, and for good reason. China and Russia both have operational hypersonic missiles in service, while the United States continues to struggle to field its own. As a result of that, you might be surprised to hear that the US once led the world in hypersonics research, and actually, we almost had crewed hypersonic aircraft in service decades ago. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. In order to understand what a big deal hypersonic bombers would be, we need to know what hypersonic means. Today's supersonic fighters and bombers can fly at speeds in excess of Mach 1, or around 760 miles per hour. Hypersonic aircraft would fly at speeds in excess of Mach 5, or better than 3,800 miles per hour. Missiles traveling at that speed are all but indefensible with today's technology, and it stands to some reason that hypersonic aircraft would be just as hard to target today. Now imagine how hard they'd be to target in the Cold War. Of course, there is a however. Because keeping a bag of meat alive inside a metal tube that's moving at better than 6,000 miles per hour is no easy undertaking. And while America's efforts to field the hypersonic aircraft didn't manifest in an operational platform, it's not hard to see why people thought this sort of mind-boggling speed really was the future of tactical aviation. And to be honest, maybe it still is. Throughout much of the Cold War, the survivability of tactical aircraft was really predicated on reaching higher altitudes and traveling at higher speeds. Nowhere was this approach more prevalent than in the field of air reconnaissance, where Lockheed and their legendary aeronautical engineer Kelly Johnson would practically define America's Cold War approach by pushing these very envelopes as a means of infiltrating contested airspace. Johnson's design for the U-2 spy plane, which entered service back in 1956, had a surface ceiling of 70,000 feet that allowed it to soar high above the limited reach of Soviet surface-to-air missiles, and even the intercept fighters of the day. That is, until 1960, when CIA pilot Gary Powers and his U-2 were shot down by the new SA-2 guideline surface-to-air missile deep inside Soviet territory. Within just four years of that incident, another brainchild of Johnson's, this time the SR-71 Blackbird, would couple an even higher service ceiling of 85,000 feet with a reported top speed of somewhere in excess of Mach 3.5. The SR-71's combination of altitude and just brute force made it practically unstoppable in its era. Over three decades of service, some 4,000 missiles of various sorts were fired at SR-71s as they screamed across the sky, and in every instance, the Blackbird pilot simply had to lean into the throttle and outrun anything that was fired at it. Not a single Blackbird was ever shot down. Of course, the U.S. wasn't only in the business of fielding unarmed recon planes, and the immense capability offered by these high-flying aircraft led to proposals and even formal efforts to arm both the U-2 and the SR-71 sister program, the YF-12, which we have a video on if you're interested. This love affair with speed and altitude extended into nearly every facet of American and Soviet military aviation all throughout the Cold War. Here in the U.S., it resulted in fast and agile fighters like the F-14 Tomcat and the legendary F-15 Eagle, as well as the supersonic B-1B Lancer bomber. Throughout much of the 1960s, a Mach 3-capable bomber dubbed the XB-70 Valkyrie was also in development, and it really seemed like the future of America's bomber fleets. In the Soviet Union, the incredible MiG-25 entered service in 1964 with a top speed of Mach 2.8. That's literally better than any American fighter ever, and it's since been recorded at speeds as high as Mach 3.2. The Soviets would later field the Tu-160 bomber, which has a top speed of better than Mach 2, making it the fastest bomber on the planet to this day. 
So with all this focus on flying higher and faster, it really seemed inevitable that American and Soviet aviators would soon move past supersonic speeds into hypersonic ones with their fighters, bombers, and reconnaissance platforms. After all, by the end of the 1960s, America already had an aircraft that could carry a pilot past the hypersonic barrier. And that brings us to the X-20 Dinosaur, which really was a hypersonic space bomber before anyone was talking about hypersonics or even space. And that story begins, like a number of others, with Operation Paperclip, which was organized by the Joint Intelligence Objectives Agency, or the JIOA, and was largely executed by the U.S. Army's Counterintelligence Corps. They brought some 1,600 Nazi scientists, engineers, and technicians to the United States at the end of World War II. Among these scientists were men like NASA's famed Werner von Braun, the man who developed the Saturn V rocket, and a few others were Walter Dornberger and Kraft Erich, who found themselves employed by Bell Aircraft. In 1952, the two German engineers proposed the concept of a sort of vertical-launched bomber and missile in one. In Germany, they had called this theoretical platform the Silbervogel, or Silverfish. Today, the plan seems pretty logical. The vehicle would be sent aloft atop a rocket booster and propelled all the way into a suborbital but exoatmospheric altitude. In other words, outside the atmosphere but lower than low Earth orbit. There it would briefly enter what we call space before gliding down towards the atmosphere and being bounced back up by the vehicle's winged body. Uncle Sam was interested, and by 1957, the program was being developed in three separate parts. A rocket bomber called Robo, a long-range reconnaissance vehicle called Brass Bell, and a hypersonic weapons research program. But as you may recall, there was a bigger space-related story in 1957, which was the launch of Sputnik 1. Just days after that happened, the U.S. reorganized their efforts, combining all three of those programs into a new single Weapon System 464L program, which was dubbed Dinosaur. In order to close this capability gap, America intended to work fast, so they planned to test their first iteration by 1963 in glide trials, with power trials to follow the next year. By then, the Dinosaur 2 was expected to exceed Mach 18 in powered flight. A missile based on the Dinosaur program was expected to enter service by 1968, with the space plane itself totally operational by 1974. So they set to work, and by 1962, the design of this new space plane was largely settled, and things were going so smoothly that they selected astronauts and began training them for test flights. Among those astronauts was a 30-year-old Navy test pilot and aeronautical engineer named Neil Armstrong, who would leave the program later that year to join a different space program that you may have heard of. Once built, the X-20 Dinosaur's first mock-up measured about 35 feet long with a bit more than a 20-foot wingspan, and it used three retractable struts for landing. Groundbreaking as this aircraft was, the effort was actually entirely feasible with the technology of the day. It was just also entirely too expensive. Rather than becoming the world's first operational hypersonic aircraft, the X-20 was killed off in 1963 in favor of NASA's rapidly developing Gemini program. But that didn't spell the end for America's hypersonic aircraft programs. In 1967, William, call sign Pete Knight, made history at the stick of his North American X-15A2 rocket-powered aircraft when he reached a speed of Mach 6.7, which is like 5,140 miles per hour at an altitude of around 102,000 feet. While this particular flight was one for the record books, it wasn't a fluke. Over nine years, 12 pilots would take the stick of the X-15 for a total of 199 flights, 13 of which even met the Air Force's criteria at the time for spaceflight, earning eight of their pilots astronaut wings. A total of three X-15s were built, and while they were indeed hypersonic aircraft, they were a long way from operational platforms. In order to achieve such incredible speeds, the X-15 relied on a liquid propellant rocket engine that would only burn for between 80 and 120 seconds. But in that short time, man oh man did it burn. 
The XLR-99 rocket engine used in the X-15 produced 600,000 horsepower and 70,400 pounds of thrust. That's about two-thirds the thrust Blue Origin's new Shepard rocket is going to leverage to send a six-person capsule into orbit. Suffice to say, this wasn't an approach that could really be used for operational aircraft. But the next year, in 1968, Lockheed teamed up with the Air Force's National Hypersonic Flight Research Facility in NASA to develop and field two hypersonic test aircraft, with each vehicle slated for 100 flights. This new aircraft design was unofficially dubbed the X-24C, and like its X-15 predecessor, it would be carried aloft by a rocket engine. But from there, a second hydrogen-fueled air-breathing scramjet mounted on the belly of the aircraft would take over. And this scramjet engine would propel the X-24C at sustained speeds in excess of Mach 6, reaching intended peak speeds that were higher than Mach 8, which is about 6,130 miles per hour. And the aircraft itself modeled the lifting body design leveraged by the Martin Marietta X-24 A and B programs that had previously tested unpowered re-entry flight characteristics. Now, that model of using scramjet propulsion is still widely considered to be among the most likely candidates for hypersonic aircraft today, but it would really take another video in itself to really discuss how scramjets work, so if that's something you'd like, make sure to let me know in the comments below. The X-24C really did seem promising for a time, and had it come to fruition, America would have likely leveraged scramjet technology in more and more platforms. Hypothetical history isn't really good for much of anything, but it does seem likely that had America continued testing in this realm, the U.S. certainly wouldn't be lagging behind nations like Russia and China in hypersonic weapons development today. And if we're going to take a minute to indulge in what-ifs, consider that Lockheed's Skunk Works were legends in their own time in the 60s and 70s for fielding the most groundbreaking military aircraft the world had literally ever seen. If anyone could make a hypersonic aircraft leveraging a combination of conventional and scramjet propulsion work in the 1970s, the guys who were making rocket-assisted F-80 fighters in the 50s and space-scraping SR-71 Blackbirds in the 60s probably could. But by the end of 1977, the L-301 program and its notional X-24C were canceled. Not even Lockheed Skunk Works could make hypersonics economical in the 1970s, and besides, they already had a different disruptive technology being developed in another room by even bigger nerds. Today, we know that program as Have Blue, and it would eventually produce the F-117 Nighthawk that would usher in the stealth revolution in military aviation. Since then, tactical aircraft design has shifted away from higher and faster, and towards smarter and sneakier. But it stands to reason that at some point the advantage stealth provides will diminish sufficiently that we once again shift our focus back towards flying higher and faster than ever before. And if that day comes, we may learn that platforms like the dinosaur aren't as extinct as we might have thought. And on that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure you swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, don't forget to tap like and subscribe, and leave me a comment to let me know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.